Carmen, thank you for that very wonderful uh, introduction and, and generous comment. She's my friend, you know. We recently had lunch in Coeur d'Alene, and I've added her as one of my very best friends. We're very fortunate to have you at the University of Idaho, and, and we're very delighted with the Human Rights Office uh, here, uh, and you're doing wonderful things. <clears throat> and I open by saying I'm so delighted to see all my friends that I've worked with over the years, and uh, it's like a reunion for me today. Uh, I have given you a handout. I want to give you something to take home with you. So you have at your table something called the three categories of non-governmental human rights and civil rights groups in America. <clears throat> in the limited time I have, I will not be able to talk too much about that, but I hope I have uh, sufficed with giving you this information. <clears throat> Let me say that, to start out the process, that in 1973, Richard Butler moved to North Idaho from Southern California and created two organizations, the Aryan Nations, and also the Church of Jesus Christ Christian, contending that he was a minister. He was very quiet until 1980, and in 1980, uh, he became very active. And there were two incidents in our community. One was the targeting of a Jewish restaurant owner in Hayden Lake, Sid Rosen, and then shortly after that, in Coeur d'Alene, a biracial family, the Connie Fort family. And from that was the birth of what is known as the Kootenai County Task Force on Human Relations. Uh, a group of wonderful citizens went out to Sid to support him. And then we met the first February, first week of February 1981 at the First Christian Church and created this organization. For lack of time, let me just really move fast forward and say that <clears throat> after several years of work and being overwhelmed with uh, the challenges and also requests, uh, in 1984, uh, we brought on board Bill Wasmuth, who was the Catholic priest at St. Pius X Catholic Church, as our president. And I want to introduce uh, Sister Carol Ann Wasmuth, who's here, and Bill was her brother. And she is a Catholic nun, and she is also a blood relative of Bill, and we're delighted she's here today. After we saw the seriousness of what was going on and also the request <clears throat> that we were receiving around the country, I asked Bill to go to lunch with me, and I always remember this. I wanted to go to Hayden Lake for the first incident had taken place, and he and I went to lunch at Sargent's, and I said to him, Bill, we've got to create a, an organization much larger than us to do the work uh, of, of uh, the region. And as Bill always did, he said, well, then let's convene a meeting of the um, Community Events Committee of the Task Force that Marshall Men shared. We had lunch at um, a restaurant in Coeur d'Alene, and we called uh, Bob Hughes with the Justice Department in Seattle, and within a very short time, we put together 17 people, and we met and crisscrossed the five Northwest states from early 1986 until April 1987, and we convened at North Idaho College, and we created what became known as the Northwest Coalition Against Malicious Harassment. Bill moved to Seattle and became the executive director and I became the president. It was a fascinating organization with 32 board members representing many different diverse groups throughout the five uh, states of Wyoming, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. The governors had a representative, the law enforcement, the task force. Uh, there was all the different minority groups on our board, uh, racial, ethnic, religious, and I don't think we've ever had an organization in the United States where a governing board represented all those groups. It prospered and we received large contributions. In fact, one $400,000 grant. And Bill was a really dynamic leader and uh, we did really well in fundraising. I left the coalition after some time to put together an international women's conference uh, and Bill then left in 1999. If you see the handout that I gave you, there is a warning on how organizations work and where they exist and, and continue to survive. I believe there are three kinds of organizations. I think they're national human civil rights groups, which is the first one on your list. And if you'll note, they really do continue to exist. Many of them were formed in the beginning of the 1900s, and um, they're over 100 years old. And I think the reason they continue to exist is they never did lose their focus, their mission. They know what their constituency is and their needs, and they have a nationwide constituency, and so they continue to prosper, and they're extremely valuable. And I'll give you some examples. 
In 1980, you might be surprised to know that in Category 2, the first task force in the United States dealing with this subject, human rights, was formed in Spokane, Washington. It was called the Interstate Task Force. And then we came about the next year, 1981. And at the end of your handout, I'm celebrating a number of these great task forces that exist today. And when you have time to read it, you can see what brought them into existence. The, the wonderful Leto Human Rights Task Force, Bonner County, um, our own Kootenai County Task Force, the Ada County Task Force, and you'll see those there. And I do want to recognize the newest one that we've had the privilege of working to help with workshops to get them going, and they're here today, and that is the Benawal Human Rights Coalition. Oh, am I proud of them. They just did a huge program in their schools on anti-bullying. Let's say thank you to them. They're the newest members. And uh, all of these have prospered. And my suggestion to you, and not criticizing any of the other categories, but I think one reason why they continue to exist, and Lake Charles, 1988, and the Bonner County, 1991, Ada County, 1992, uh, and uh, the one in Spokane does not exist any longer. They decided to disband when they created the Spokane City Human Rights Commission. Lisa, the chair of that board is here. Oh, what great leader she is. And we met recently, and we're going to do some partnering together with that wonderful commission. And so I think they continue to prosper because they are very clear in their mission. They have the, their eye on the prize, and they're very focused. And they work in their community. Now, I'm not criticizing organizations that have staff. Staff's needed often. And certainly colleges and corporations and some human rights groups, such as the National Group. But these groups do not have staff. They do not have buildings and facilities, but they have a remarkable yet dedicated board and volunteers. And the money that they raise, which is limited, all the resources they have goes directly into their mission. And usually that mission includes, uh, number one, trying to combat hate, malicious harassment, hate crimes, and they're there as allies of victims. We are now right here uh, in um, the day when, in our organization, we have three cases right now. And we go to court, we work with the prosecutors, and we work with the police, and we say no to hate. And the second thing some of these groups take on, which we have taken on in more recent years, is to oppose discrimination and help those individuals in jobs, housing, and public accommodation. In fact, one of our cases right now is a discrimination case. And I do want to recognize our hero, our attorney, Norm Gessels, right here. He's the one that had the Keenan's case and brought in the Southern Poverty Law Center and defeated the Aryan Nations. And we probably ought to say thank you to Norm Gissel. <laughs> and so I'm very optimistic about their continued survival because they are just not getting off message. And the people in that community support them because they see the good that they do. And Joanne, who's here from the Lake Talk, if you look at the, at the end of Lake Talk, Task Force had three reasons to come into existence. And one of those is because of a survey, and I have a copy of the survey that we commissioned through the Northwest Coalition and through also um, the Idaho Human Rights Commission with Boise State University. And there were some troubling results in 1988 of that. And the task force here said, there's some attitudinal problems and we want to be part of the solution to that. Unfortunately, if you look at Category 3, what I call regional human rights groups, and they have a very important function to play, but they've also had some real challenges and, uh, and, and some real problems. For example, if you look at the first two, the split is here, the Northwest Coalition and the Coalition for Human Dignity in Portland no longer exists. After Bill left in 1999, the board tried to find another Bill Wasmuth in the country, and they didn't find one. And then I, I thought they made a mistake, and Bill agreed with me. They decided to merge with the Coalition for Human Dignity out of Portland. Not that it was not a good organization, but their mission was very, very different than the Coalition. They reorganized, and many of the board members of the original Coalition were off the board. And the staff that took over at, in Seattle, they lost their mission. They lost their focus. And they... And I warn and caution these groups because when they start, almost all of them have a great, great financial gift. In the case of the coalitions, I said we had 400,000 from one source alone. And 
then uh, we were very focused on, with, with enough money, we wanted to do three things. We wanted to have a building, so we had visibility. We wanted to have a staff that would be able to lead that, that would do a lot of things, and then we put a lot of the money in programs. What they did, unfortunately, after Bill left and, and they did some reorganizing, they lost their focus. When in trouble financially, boards tend to do the following in this category. The board says, and I'm not sure to be critical, I'm just simply saying, the board says, well, we have to keep the building because it's our visibility. And second, we want to keep our staff, we have an obligation to them, and they're doing some meaningful things. But we're in trouble, so we have to cut something, so we cut the programs, and then they die. Because if you get down to where only a small percentage of your total funding is going to programs, people quit contributing. When the Northwest Coalition closed, they were in debt. They owed rent on their building. They owed a man in Boise $10,000 who had helped them with their class conference. And they closed their doors in debt and were never able to pay it off. I, I caution about that. And so you have to, in any of these categories, in my humble opinion, you must never forget why you exist. You never forget what your duties, responsibilities, and your mission is. If you do, you will die. I've seen a statistic that when dealing with non-profits, not just human rights, they tend to last about nine years. Then after we created the Northwest Coalition in 1986-87, then something else happened. The task force, the Kootenai County Task Force, has been really involved in trying to initiate other groups. In 1998, Mary Lou Reed, who was a state center, called me and she said, Tony, the Kootenai County Task Force does not have a 501c3 because we don't want to be restricted. What we, we know we like to praise political leaders, we like to criticize political leaders, and we want to be very free. We have very little money, so we're legally okay. But she said, Tony, you need a 501c3 for the area of education. And very fortunately, we were able to create in 1998 something called the Human Rights Education Institute, and the Director of Education is here, Heather's over here today, and uh, she works very hard with the Institute. We got lucky also after we created it. I have a dear friend named Greg Carr, and, and oh my, how he's intervened. And so after the case was won in 2000 concerning the Aryan nations and the victims got the property, uh, and Norm was working hard on that, and along with Morris, Deeds, Morris had left, and, and he was representing the, the victims. And so they sold the compound to uh, Greg Carr. He called me and said, I'll buy it. And then we spent a whole summer up there with construction group, and all we destroyed everything and made it a peace park and gave it to North Idaho College Foundation. And that was a great victory. And then one day I'm in the office, and Greg emails me and says, Heather, he says, um, I'm going to give you a million dollars for HREI. Oh, my goodness, I was in shock. And I called Mary Lou and said, I've got kind of an interesting email here. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, we just got a million dollars. She said, what do you mean kind of interest? This changed our life. <laughs> And so what HREI has done, they have created a, a space, a building in, at the park, which is very visible. They have two part-time staff now. Uh, at times they've had full-time staff. And they have programs. And Heather would agree with me, I'm sure, that the, the challenge that lies ahead for HREI is their funding has also been more challenging recently. The money that Greg Hart gave is mostly gone. And, our task force has helped them. We've given 140000 over the last 13 years with our human rights banquet. And they've done some very, very important projects. So the challenge is, and it's up to their board, their challenge is how can they uh, sustain their organization financially? So I think of all three categories, the regional groups have the most challenge. And in the short time I have left, I also want to mention a few things about the Benoit uh, County Human Rights Coalition. They were my buddies. <laughs> and Christina Crawford, who's here, and Marilyn, who's here, came and had lunch with me and said, we want to create a task force in the middle They have some real challenges and some conflicts that some people have with the wonderful Coeur d'Alene tribe. And then we decided to have a workshop all day, and we planned strategy. And I have to say, they're following it to the letter. And uh, they're winning friends daily. And so this anti-bullying with almost 100 students involved with the parents. They're going to honor the veterans, they're at parades, and they will change gradually the culture of Middlewalk County. I know it's happening, and they have to be very patient. Let me leave this with you. It is my view as a 
when I was a child, a story that applies to all of you and all these organizations. There's that great story of the uh, race that's going on down the road, and um, the tortoise is racing against the hare, or I call it the rabbit, and you know the tortoise cannot win because the tortoise physically is very slow. But unfortunately, what happens to the hare is they, that that animal gets distracted off in the briar patch and all, and the tortoise keeps going every day and wins the race. So if you're going to win, you have to have persistence. And you're in it for the long haul, not the short haul. And so as you move forward, Carmen, with this wonderful experiment, let me caution you about several things, if I may. After 40 years of working with organizations uh, while teaching at the same time, please let me humbly suggest the following. First of all, be very clear with your mission and focus on that mission. Never leave it. Never take your eye off the prize. You won't continue. Because people are very wise and they see what you and, and you do publicly announce what you're all about. And you have to continue to do that. Second, if you have any resources, and this group may not, it may be the individual groups that, you know, what Carmen said to me is that, which I like very much, is becoming a clearinghouse uh, where through this office here, all of you will communicate from time to time through the newsletter where you will uh, inform others what's going on in other places or events can go to or activities you can engage in. It's what we're going to do in Spokane with our new partnership. So that is very important to uh, be very clear on that. And uh, all of, most of your organizations have very, very limited financial resources, but you can maximize those through working together and partnering in the process. Let me also add another recommendation, and that is be willing to take the criticism. You will be criticized, and you will be attacked. Uh, recently, in fact, yesterday, I was attacked and criticized um, because of, uh, and I hadn't done anything I thought that was incredible. <laughs> anyway, one of my friends attended a speech I gave uh, at a luncheon in Coeur d'Alene. It was a wonderful study we'd done on the, the most recent U.S. Census and Spokesman Review covered it back in May. Uh, we have become a much more diverse community. I mean by that, Nespers, Latah, Kootenai, Spokane, and Bonner. I took the larger counties because, you know, if you're in a county that's real small, and there's one African American, and then you have two, you have a 100% increase, that, is, that statistic can be misleading. <laughs> so what we found, though, is that 75,000 people living in those counties that are of a minority population. So my point is that uh, we have defeated Butler in that sense. He wanted to make it a white enclave, and it isn't. Anyway, I gave this speech. One of my friends came and saw the blog yesterday. She was bitterly attacked because she attended a speech I gave. And so she responded by saying, I'll choose my own friends. And so I, that, that's a very simple thing, but, but oftentimes there's threats on people's life. Bill's uh, home was bombed, and there was bombs off uh, downtown. We were threatened with our lives. And, so there are challenges, and I hope you will uh, keep in mind that through your unity and working together and support one another in those difficult times, uh, that will help. So uh, let me simply close by saying that I am celebrating today with you. It's really, Carmen, very exciting. And um, there will be, at times, disagreements. And uh, uh, But in our case, in the task force, we've been really fortunate. We have such unity in our board meetings, and I guess I could leave this with you too. And this may apply to the task force when it does other groups here. Um, we have some principles and also some strategy that we followed from day one. And here are two important points. One, we never, never remain silent in the face of hate. Never. And secondly, and we learned this from my background in the South observing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We never, never attend, some people disagree and that's fine, but we never, never attend any event that hate groups put on. I use this as an example where Dr. King was so brilliant, he never once went to a Klan rally or a cross burning. He was too smart. He had his own marches, his own programs, and they would come and react to him. See, 
whoever is setting up the program is in charge of the agenda. And so we always believed that we should do things too at the same time, but an alternative method. Let me give you one quick example. I'm over time, but uh, when Richard Butler decided the very first time he had marched with Sherman in 1998, and that's what caused this incident, the town was so upset in the community that when the Keenans went by and the car backfired, uh, their nations were very tense, but, and that's when they shot the car five times, and it was like a, 10 days before the march. And so that, but that began the beginning of the end of the United Nations. But when he marched in 1998, we decided that we had to do something, but we would do something different. So we did two or three weird things. We, we organized a Gonzaga University rally with a thousand people. We had a car caravan with ribbons and all. But our most successful event was we did Lemons to Lemonade. We started in January, knowing he'd do it in July, and we did a nationwide campaign. We asked people to pledge money for every minute he marched. He marched for 27 minutes and we raised $34,000 for diversity. And he was very angry at us. And he said, we're gonna sue you. And I said, great, do you wanna know who our lawyer is? I said, there he is. And, and uh, what we decided to do, and I'll quit with this, but I'm just talking strategy. That's another point I wanna leave, Carmen. Strategy is extremely essential. The means you use to the end are absolutely crucial. And so what we did, we said to people, you, when you give the money, you can give it to our task force or some other group. And so some of the money was pledged to the NAACP and Spokane, the Northwest Coalition got several thousand, and we got 24,000. So then I said to our board, let's let Richard Butler worry about this for one full year. So we're going to divide this money into three sections. And in four months, we'll have a press conference, and we'll give money to teachers. Uh, out, out of 24,000, that was about seven or eight thousand each time and so then when we had the press conference and we gave the money and showed what they were going to do with it we thanked richard butler for raising money for diversity <laughs> and then in eight months we did it the second time and then at the end of the year we did it a third time was it more important to stand on the side of the street and look at him for 27 minutes or was the lemonades uh, much more important now, i'm not here to criticize i'm just saying that is the way we operate and in, and also i would say that um, we do two things we're proactive and we're reactive. You have to react to those things, but then you have to also be proactive. You've been very patient, and I thank you, and I wish you really good luck.